languages, German, English, French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Swedish, Latvian, Lithuanian, Polish, Slovakian and Bulgarian. Item number three, I would like to very warmly welcome Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO. Uh, dear Jens Stoltenberg, once again, a warm welcome to the European Parliament to this joint meeting of our Foreign Affairs Committee and our Subcommittee on Security and Defence. Since you last participated in a similar format in July last year, several important milestones and developments took place on the international and security scene. The Russian war of aggression against Ukraine has, as we have all witnessed, provoked a tectonic shift on the geopolitical landscape and has brought a fully-fledged war back to Europe and to our borders. This shows the need for closer cooperation with NATO and like-minded allies across the globe. Secretary General, we are aware of the significant results of the recent NATO summit in Vilnius on the 11th and 12th of July. One of the key issues is Ukraine's NATO membership. Ukrainians are not only defending themselves, their freedom and their future, they are also defending our values, our freedom and our future. Another important step was the establishment of the NATO-Ukraine Council, this joint body replacing the nato Ukraine Commission will also serve as a crisis consultation mechanism between NATO and Ukraine. So, dear Secretary General, we would like to hear your views related to all questions around the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. Another important step was and is Finland's and Sweden's access to NATO. From an EU perspective, we warmly welcome this important move. Secretary General, how do you see the balance of powers within the alliance? And finally, a point regarding EU-NATO cooperation. I warmly welcome the signature of the third joint declaration on the 10th of January. I would like to hear from you your analysis regarding the implementation of the 14 points set out in this political declaration. Euro importantly, European defence capabilities should be compatible and complementary with NATO, our first and foremost security guarantor. I would now like to give the floor to the Secretary-General, but before, let me hand over to our Chair of our Subcommittee, Natalie Loiseau, for her introductory remarks. Please. Whether you're relaxing after a long day or prepping for that all-important meeting, rest easy at over 800 locations. Only available at premierin.com. Merci, David. Et au nom de la Commission Sécurité et Défense, je souhaite moi aussi souhaiter la bienvenue à M. Stoltenberg. Il s'agit de notre premier échange depuis le sommet de Vilnius. Euh, le sujet a été brièvement abordé la semaine dernière à Tolède, lors de la réunion informelle des ministres de la Défense, à laquelle j'ai participé au nom du Parlement européen. Malheureusement, vous n'avez pas pu être présent et c'est donc une bonne occasion de, de vous entendre. Le sommet s'est naturellement déroulé dans le contexte de la guerre d'agression menée par la Russie contre l'Ukraine. Les attentes avant le sommet étaient élevées, tant de la part de l'Ukraine qu'espérait des plans d'adhésion clairs et des engagements en matière de sécurité que de la part des alliés qui espéraient des progrès pour l'adhésion de la Suède. Le renforcement de la dissuasion et de la défense de l'Alliance, en particulier sur le flanc oriental, figurait parmi les autres questions prioritaires à l'ordre du jour du sommet. Je dois dire que s'agissant aussi bien des perspectives d'adhésion de l'Ukraine que de l'adhésion effective de la Suède, il y a eu des, des avancées moins déterminantes qu'on aurait pu l'espérer. Le langage concernant l'Ukraine ne marque pas une si grande différence par rapport au sommet de Bucarest dont on a pu mesurer qu'il avait ouvert des perspectives sans donner de réelles garanties de sécurité à Kiev. Heureusement, le travail engagé, notamment en format G7, en matière de soutien à l'Ukraine, vient en quelque sorte compenser cette déception dont vous n'êtes pas responsable, monsieur le secrétaire général, mais qui est toutefois réelle. S'agissant de l'adhésion effective de la Suède, je voudrais saluer vos efforts pour sortir d'une impasse imposée par la Turquie sur des motifs qui sont, hélas, sans lien avec la question fondamentale de la sécurité transatlantique. On attend toutefois avec impatience que les engagements pris par le président Erdogan se traduisent rapidement dans les faits pour que la Suède puisse enfin s'appuyer sur l'Alliance et la faire bénéficier de ses atouts propres. Vous pourrez nous dire où vous pensez que nous en sommes euh, du point de vue de la mise en œuvre des engagements pris par le président turc. 
Je me félicite que les alliés, comme le souligne le communiqué du sommet, réitèrent leur engagement en faveur de la coopération Union européenne, autant qu'ils considèrent comme essentiel pour la sécurité et la prospérité de la région euro-atlantique. Cette reconnaissance de la valeur ajoutée d'une défense européenne plus structurée et plus crédible met fin, ou du moins je l'espère, aux querelles inutiles et atteste du caractère complémentaire de la défense européenne par rapport à l'OTAN. Je voudrais revenir brièvement sur quelques points en ce qui concerne l'Ukraine. Chaque retard, chaque hésitation sur le type d'aide militaire à fournir à l'Ukraine ne fait que prolonger le conflit et augmenter le coût humain de cette guerre. Il ne nous suffit pas de nous engager à aider l'Ukraine aussi longtemps qu'il le faudra, même si c'est naturellement souhaitable. Dans quelle mesure les alliés sont-ils prêts à accentuer leur soutien pour que la contre-offensive puisse enregistrer des succès décisifs Sur la formation des troupes ukrainiennes, nous menons au niveau européen un effort sans précédent en quantité. Quels progrès peuvent être envisagés pour s'assurer ensemble de la bonne coordination des efforts de formation entre l'Union européenne et certains alliés de l'OTAN et de la qualité opérationnelle de ces formations C'est cela une bonne coopération Union européenne. Autant, ça n'est ne, pas que des euh, extraits de conclusions de, de sommets euh, à intervalles réguliers. Et en ce qui concerne les plans de défense de l'OTAN, j'aimerais que vous nous parliez de la mobilité militaire. L'Union européenne a fait des efforts. Je ne suis pas sûre que ces efforts soient encore suffisants. Et j'aimerais beaucoup vous entendre sur ce plan-là. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Nathalie Loiseau, for your introductory remarks. And without further ado, I now give the floor to our Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. Please. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair, uh, David, and Nathalie, and, uh, and uh, their friends in the European uh, Parliament. It's, it is really a great pleasure to, to uh, see you again, to engage uh, with you uh, again here in the European uh, Parliament, because I really appreciate this expression of uh, NATO-EU uh, EU cooperation um, uh, to meet with you. And uh, as you know, uh, to strengthen the cooperation between NATO and the European Union has, has been a top priority for me uh, since I uh, started my tenure as uh, Secretary General of NATO in 2014. I believe in NATO-EU cooperation uh, because we share the same uh, values, uh, uh, we share uh, uh, the same uh, challenges. We are two different organizations, but we have a lot in common. Uh, as you know, 600 million uh, Europeans live in a NATO country. And uh, when uh, Sweden uh, joins uh, uh, NATO, 96% of uh, the citizens of the European Union live in a NATO country. So yes, we are different, different institutions, but we have a lot in common. Uh, and therefore, it is... Uh, It's good to see that over the uh, recent years, uh, we have been able to strengthen NATO-EU cooperation uh, on cyber, on space, uh, on critical infrastructure, on military mobility, and we work hand in hand in the Western Balkans, in, in Kosovo, uh, and also in addressing the illegal migration uh, uh, in the Aegean Sea and in many other areas. And this is also reflected through the fact that, as you refer to, that Um, uh, earlier this year, I signed the third uh, joint declaration between um, uh, 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 the two EU presidents, um, uh, uh, President von der Leyen and President uh, uh, Michel, uh, uh, and then um, they participated in the uh, EU summit in Vilnius. Uh, uh, Ursula and Charles was there, uh, as I participated um, uh, in June. Uh, I met with all the, all the EU leaders in the European Council. So, so we meet at different levels. We work closer together, uh, reflecting the reality that we have so much uh, uh, together and need uh, to, uh, to work together. So I would like to commend you uh, um, uh, uh, as uh, European uh, parliamentarians for supporting these efforts, enabling uh, the strengthened cooperation between uh, the European Union and, uh, and NATO. And, and, of course, we have a lot uh, uh, more to do But we could be quite proud of how far we have been able to move over the last years in, 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 in ensuring the partnership, the bond between our two organizations. NATO-EU cooperation has always been important, but the war in Ukraine has made it even more important. 
uh, because this is the most brutal um, uh, war we have seen, uh, the biggest uh, war uh, we have seen in, in Europe since the Second World War, uh, and that makes it even more important that we stand together. And the reality is that um, President Putin made at least two big strategic mistakes when he invaded uh, Ukraine last year. The first and most important was, of course, that he totally underestimated the Ukrainians, the strength, the commitment, the courage of the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian political leadership and the Ukrainian armed forces. The other big strategic mistake he made was to underestimate us. Our willingness, our, our, our uh, commitment to support Ukraine, to stand by Ukraine with economic sanctions, with political support, but not least with the military uh, support. And that's, uh, 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 and that's unprecedented, what we have seen now, of uh, uh, military support from NATO allies, from EU members, from uh, EU, from NATO. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and this is a support which is much bigger than anyone expected when this war started, with, um, with advanced uh, artillery, with, uh, with uh, long-range cruise missiles, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, advanced air defense systems, uh, with a lot of uh, ammunition and not least training from EU, from NATO uh, uh, allies. And, uh, and now also I would like to commend uh, the Netherlands, Denmark and also Norway for announcing that they are ready to deliver F-16s and many allies have also announced that they are ready to start uh, training uh, of Ukrainian pilots and, uh, and uh, technicians to enable them to have uh, F-16s. So again, there is much more we need to do, and we need to support and sustain this support. But if we just stop for a moment and think where we are today, compared to where we thought we were going to be just weeks ahead of the uh, invasion, I think we need to, to recognize the, 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 the strength, the commitment, not least uh, enabled by the European Parliament, uh, for uh, EU members, for uh, NATO allies, for our institutions to stand by Ukraine. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and that's extremely important to recognize because uh, this is something that needs to uh, continue. Our support has helped to enable uh, the Ukrainians uh, to launch the counteroffensive. Uh, 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 the Ukrainians are gradually uh, gaining uh, ground. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, uh, and, it, and it proves uh, the importance of our support and also our ability and, and, and willingness uh, to continue uh, the support because this is heavy fighting, difficult uh, fighting, but they have been able to breach uh, the uh, defensive lines uh, of uh, the Russian forces, and they are uh, moving uh, uh, moving uh, forward. Um, as you, uh, and that was also the clear commitment and clear message from the NATO summit uh, in July, uh, that we need to continue to support uh, Ukraine. That has been the message from the European Union again and again. Uh, and, uh, and the offensive just highlights the importance of, uh, of standing by them. Um, um, at the NATO summit, um, the, the main message was, of course, support to Ukraine. We were also uh, able to make progress uh, on uh, Ukraine's path towards uh, 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 NATO membership. Um, we we recognise what the European Union has done uh, in granting them candidate status. Um, in NATO, uh, at the Vilnius summit, we made important decisions to help to move Ukraine closer to uh, membership. We reiterated that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. But then we added three elements which actually uh, uh, moved them closer to membership. First, we agreed a substantial package and also funding for a, a substantial package to ensure full interoperability between the Ukrainian armed forces and uh, NATO. And interoperability between our armed forces is really a way to, in practical terms, move, NATO closer, uh, move Ukraine closer to, uh, to NATO membership. The second thing we did was to strengthen the political institutionalized uh, cooperation. We established something called the NATO-Ukraine Council, where we don't meet Ukraine as a partner, we meet as equals around the table, uh, uh, 31 allies, soon, soon 32, and then with uh, Ukraine uh, around the table as an equal. This council can make decisions. 
Uh, it can convene on a short notice. It can address a, a crisis, uh, uh, as we did uh, um, just after the summit with, uh, when, the, when the grain deal was suspended. Uh, and, and, and the plan is now to really develop the NATO Ukraine Commission uh, to a practical, to an important tool to strengthen the bonds between uh, NATO uh, uh, and, um, and, um, and uh, Ukraine. And the third thing we did at the NATO summit was to uh, remove the requirement for membership action plan for Ukraine to become a member. Because previously the idea was to grant the country membership action plan and that was a step towards uh, uh, invitation. Uh, at the Vilnius summit, we said that there is no need for a membership action plan because uh, uh, Ukraine has already moved closer to, uh, to NATO. So we turn now the membership process um, uh, from a two-step process to a one-step process. And these three things, uh, the, the interoperability, the NATO-Ukraine Council, and the removal of the requirement for a membership action plan for Ukraine, uh, 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 are, uh, demonstrates that Ukraine has never been closer to a membership uh, in NATO than now. And let me just end by saying that this reflects the, the political reality that nations are sovereign, nations decide themselves, and Ukraine has, of course, the right to, try, to de decide its own path, and it's up to Ukraine and NATO allies to decide uh, when uh, Ukraine becomes a member, uh, Russia cannot veto uh, uh, membership for any sovereign independent state uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. The other main uh, uh, issue at the NATO summit uh, was uh, to strengthen our deterrence and defence. Uh, because fundamentally NATO has two tasks uh, when it comes to the war in Ukraine. One is to support Ukraine as NATO allies and NATO does do. Uh, the second uh, is uh, to uh, prevent escalation and uh, uh, therefore um, uh, uh, we have already increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance to send a very clear message to Moscow to remove any room for misunderstanding, miscalculation that NATO is there to defend every inch of NATO territory one for all, all for one. Uh, uh, at the NATO summit uh, we agreed new plans uh, uh, for the defense of the whole alliance uh, we also agreed uh, to establish and to identify uh, uh, more high redness troops, 300,000 troops on uh, different levels of high uh, redness, um, and also have more uh, um, air and naval uh, capabilities um, ready to quickly reinforce uh, if needed. The purpose of this is to prevent war. The purpose of this is to ensure that NATO continues to be the most successful alliance in history because we have prevented any military attack on any NATO allies. And when there is a full-fledged war going on in Europe, then it becomes even more important that we have credible deterrence. And by strengthening our deterrence and defense, we are preventing war, preserving peace for NATO uh, uh, allies because there is no room for miscalculation. Um, and the third thing was that um, uh, NATO allies uh, have really now demonstrated that they are delivering on the commitment we made in 2014 uh, because the war didn't start in February last year, it started in 2014. The full-fledged invasion happened last year, but the war, the illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, uh, Russia went into East Donbass in 2014. Since then, NATO has implemented the biggest uh, uh, adaptation of this alliance in modern uh, history, in, in, in decades. Uh, and part of that is to invest more in defense. I think I've told you before that I know it's hard to allocate money for defense because most politicians uh, want to spend money on health, on education, on infrastructure instead of defense. But sometimes you have to invest in defense and when tensions are going up, uh, risks are increasing, that we have to invest more. And uh, uh, this year we expect NATO allies to increase defense spending by more than 8% in real terms. This is the biggest increase in decades, and it shows that uh, uh, allies are now, and of course many of them, most of them are, are also EU members, um, uh, are now taking this very seriously. More money for defence also enables us to invest more in production of ammunition, which is extremely critical. I welcome the efforts, I welcome the decisions by the European Union, uh, which goes hand in hand what we do in NATO. In NATO, have, uh, we have different uh, uh, arrangements for joint procurement of ammunition. We have done that for many years. We have something called a NATO uh, Support and Procurement Agency. I welcome 
uh, efforts by EU members, NATO allies, uh, to jointly uh, ramp up production, and we work closely with the defence industry throughout the alliance uh, in, uh, in EU, but also in non-EU uh, allied countries, uh, uh, to uh, produce more and more spending is a precondition uh, uh, for also uh, increased uh, uh, production. Um, then, uh, lastly, um, uh, uh, on, on Sweden, so first of all, it is historic that uh, 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 now Finland is a member of the alliance. Um, and we have to remember the background. The background was that President Putin declared in the autumn of 2021, and he actually sent a, a draft treaty that he wanted NATO to sign to promise no more NATO enlargement. That was what, what he sent us. And that was, that, that was a precondition for not invade uh, 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 Ukraine. Of course, we didn't sign that. The opposite happened. He wanted us to sign a promise never to enlarge NATO. He wanted us to remove our military infrastructure in, in all allies that have joined NATO since 1997, meaning half of NATO, all the Central and Eastern Europe. We should remove NATO uh, from, from that part of, uh, of our alliance, introducing some kind of E and B, or second-class membership. We rejected that. So he went to war to prevent uh, uh, NATO, uh, more NATO uh, close to his borders. He has, he, he has got the exact opposite. He has got more NATO presence in the eastern part of the alliance, and he has also uh, 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 seen that Finland has already joined the alliance, and Sweden will soon be a full member. Because at the Vilnius summit, uh, uh, we agreed um, uh, a, a statement uh, where uh, it was clearly expressed how uh, Sweden will uh, do more, uh, follow up the agreement we had in Madrid on uh, fighting terrorism um, uh, and also address issues related to um, export of, uh, of military equipment. And then uh, um, uh, Turkey made it clear that they will uh, ratify as soon as possible. This has been reiterated by President Erdogan several times. So I expect that when the Turkish parliament reconvenes later this autumn, uh, the ratification will happen uh, as soon as possible, which has been stated again and again. And then uh, we will be 32 allies, and both Sweden and Finland uh, will be members. Uh, this, is, this is good for uh, the Nordic countries, it's good for Finland and Sweden, and it's also good for NATO, and it demonstrates that uh, uh, when President Putin invaded a European country uh, to prevent uh, more NATO, he's getting the exact opposite. I think I used my 10 minutes or even more so, so I think I stopped there to allow as much time as possible for comments and questions. I'm looking forward to our, to our discussions. So thank you so much. Whether you're relaxing after a long day or prepping for that all important meeting, rest easy at over 800 locations. Only available at premierin.com. Thank you very much, Secretary General Stoltenberg, for your introductory remarks. That was good input for our Q&A session. I now first give the floor to our Chairman of the Delegation for Relations with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, Tom van denken de Lade. Tom, the floor is yours for three minutes. Thank, thank you for the floor, David, and I also appreciate holding this very timely, important and indeed already traditional exchange of views with the NATO Secretary General. Mr. Stoltenberg, I want to congratulate you for another year at NATO's helm, but also pay tribute to your leadership, dedication and your commitment to keep us as Europeans free and safe. And if I look back at the Vilnius summit, I was glad to see the sustained demonstration of transatlantic unity and de determination in responding to Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. I think in Vilnius, the alliance came up with the right responses to the, challenging, to the challenges we're facing together. It is clear that NATO remains essential for the security of our continent, the EU, and the partners in Europe and all citizens involved. And that's why I think we should continue to focus on uh, the partnership, the strong partnership between the Union and NATO. Allow me three short questions in that regard. The first one, uh, beyond the obvious need to continue working together in supporting Ukraine, what indeed would you describe as the most urgent priorities of EU-NATO cooperation after the signature of the joint declaration? The second question with regard to our legislative ambition on the joint procurement of military equipment, EDIRPA, and the act in support of ammunition production, ASAP, as well as to NATO's new defense and production action plan, what would be your assessment of the coordination between EU and NATO concerning the delivery 
of military assistance to Ukraine, precisely the coordination between uh, the, um, the two. And thirdly and lastly, and I've already asked uh, this question to you before regard, regarding the protection of democracy, how would you assess the feasibility of effectively establishing the envis envisaged NATO Center for Democratic Resilience still under your term in office? It's an institution which Congressman Gerald Connolly and I have been pleading for already in the past. Thank you so much for being here with us today and for the Frank Exchange. Thank you, Tom. And now I hand over to Nathalie Loiseau. She will chair the second part of our meeting. Thank you, David. Now I will give the floor to you, colleagues, starting with uh, AFET and CETE coordinators for two minutes each. Uh, and the first is Michael Gala for EPP AFET. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, for your uh, input here and your continuous presence in our, in our committees. Uh, I think that's very valuable for us and I would also particularly also as uh, the standing rapporteur for Ukraine thank you for your continuous and relentless uh, efforts and, and uh, policies that, uh, to, to strengthen uh, uh, Ukraine's defense capabilities and to, to motivate our member states to deliver uh, uh, constantly and, and more, uh, as, as definitely more is needed. Um, and I wonder, as you referred, and it was referred to, to our ongoing legislation, EDERPA and ASAP, uh, when it comes to, to uh, better standardization and, and also the uh, efforts to get the uh, uh, common procurement better, uh, do you see potential in our legislative Part that we can deliver better for the common cause. Uh, do you see there uh, concrete points where we should embark on uh, in, 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 the, in the immediate future? One question. Another.